everyone. This is A Bit of Business. On behalf of Learmedia.tv and the British and Irish Trading Alliance, welcome to the show. My name is John Fitzgerald. Our topic today is the circular economy. And consider this, ladies and gentlemen, the past 150 years of industrial development has been dominated by a linear economy model of production and consumption where goods are manufactured, sold, used, and then discarded. While this model has been successful in providing affordable products and prosperity to billions of people around the world, the harsh reality is that resources are becoming increasingly constrained as the global population grows and demand for goods skyrockets due to the increased disposal, disposable income of emerging middle classes. So what's to be done? Our special guest today will help dig into this in a little bit more detail, Alistair Wickens and uh, Graham Preecy. Thanks for joining us today. And by way of introduction, gentlemen, Alistair is the CEO and founder of Sussex-based Goscombe Homes, who are investing over £10 million to create 300 jobs and apprenticeships in Sussex while delivering up to 500 affordable homes each year when fully operational. Homes England have said that the Goscombe model has the potential to radically change the way affordable housing is delivered and sustainable communities are created. Their efforts will create more than £100 million of economic and social value, which will hugely benefit the people of Sussex. This is a profit with purpose organisation that is placing social value at the very core of its business model. Graham Preecy, now based in Normandy in France, has helped multiple PLCs and not-for-profit distribution organizations apply the principles of social, environmental, and economic value to their businesses. He did this for 10 years at Legal and General as their head of sustainability, investing over £25 million into social value projects. He is now involved at board level in a number of organizations all looking to positively impact the world and improve people's lives. This includes Goscombe Homes, where he is an NED and member of the advisory board, helping this margin for business business, mission business to give more people a place to call home. So, gentlemen, according to McKinsey, the idea of the circular economy is very simple. It is to run an economy or a company like a forest a living, growing entity that does not waste anything. Mm. This obviously involves eliminating waste from business and reusing all consumable and durable goods. So my first question is, do you agree with this definition? And how far away are we from a world where the circular economy really is an accepted way of working for any new or existing business? So let me start with Graham on this and move to Alistair. Yeah, so yeah, like uh, business is a forest. It's interesting. It's um, I, I'll go back to my A level chemistry on circular economy. So a long time ago, uh, but the the principle of chemistry is there's a limited amount of atoms, and they can take different states. And I think the circular economy is very similar to that. You know, we're on this planet, and there's only so many resources, and the circular economy is about how you treat those resources accepting that they're all limited um and and it's interesting you know the uh, there's a the debate on oil for example and plastics that i know uh, bitter are very very keen on eliminating plastics and reuse of plastics um there's an argument that says keep all the oil in the ground we don't need any more atoms we don't need any more plastic coming out of the ground we need to repurpose what already has been processed and used uh, and the economy bit of the circular economy is um, someone wants to pay for the thing that you've converted. When, you, when you've moved something from being a plastic to another type of plastic, someone's got to pay at the end of this and go, yeah, that's valuable to me. Um, and, and I think the other thing that particularly with COVID and what's going on in the world right now, um, businesses have really realized that money cannot buy anything. 
Uh, and so for the first time in running businesses, you cannot assume that you can throw money at anything to secure any resources to, uh, to run your business. And so therefore you're gonna to have to recycle a lot more. And that could be ideas, that could be materials you already have or materials that other people have already used. Uh, so I like the McKinsey replenishment bit. I think uh, there's one challenge to the McKinsey bit is that uh, you can't buy any forest using their analogy. And actually uh, that forest is limited. Mm. We're in a very resource scarce world right now. Mm. Alistair, your thoughts on that definition and how far away we are from a world where mm. that type of thinking uh, is, is commonplace. Mm. Well, I, I like the definition. I like the forestry um, comparison that you use there. Um, because I've often looked at the, at the circular economy, you know, by definition, I think it's the World Economic Forum's definition, actually, that uh, they, they describe it as restorative and regenerative by intention and design. And that, that's always how I've kind of viewed the circular economy. Um, is, it, is it something that's achievable? Um, I, I think that we can come on, we'd have a good debate about whether that is, is possible. I love what Graham said there about, you know, there's a limited number of atoms. So by definition, there's going to be a time when we run out of those resources. Um, in a way, we've, we're, we're being forced into doing something here. Um, how far are we along that line at the moment? It, it's interesting when you look at the way the linear economy is structured and founded at the moment, you know, based upon you know, profits being made and an established way of working in the world, consumers adopt it and understand it, buy into it. Um, how long is it going to be before we actually see a change in behaviours with the consumers? Because until we get to that point, you know, the behaviour change argument has been addressed, we're never going to really see the full potential of the circular economy. Now, I come from a behavioural background, so I, I spent 20 years in behaviour change in the health tech world. And I know from experiments that were done all over the world and experiments that we did as a team, uh, change in behaviours can take a long time. Um, but once you, get, once you get to the point where that behaviour has been kind of programmed into you, um, and you could say, taking it very simply, how long does it take you to get used to having a cup of tea without a spoonful of sugar in it, because there's a point in time when putting that sugar into the cup of tea um, tastes obnoxious again. You know, you, you go, you, you remove the sugar, you get used to it. It's a horrible taste when you first start, but trying to put the sugar back in after a while, um, it's the sugar then that becomes the horrible taste. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get to that point? Now for sugar, I can tell you just from a biological perspective, it took me about seven weeks to change my behaviours and have it as irreversible at that point. But how long is it going to take the world to actually adopt to the real benefits of the circular economy? I can't answer that. Mm. It's just going to be it's a lot longer than six or seven weeks. I think so. And you mentioned an interesting point there about the economics of all this. And mm. Graham, how do we shift companies away from a model where they have economic and legal incentives to sell products with built-in obsolescence. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, I'm based, I'm based in France and in, in Normandy, uh, and there's, they've just passed a law in France now that any new, I think it's electrical product, has to have uh, a rating on it that shows how recyclable that is at point of sale. So it has to indicate to the consumer, is it easy for this to be recycled or not? Mm. And, and, and suddenly you've got a different decision choice, right? Is if I buy this and I'm, incre I'm increasingly worried about how can someone else use it uh, or can the parts be used again? Um, that's right in front of the consumer now. Now, some may choose... Uh, that still doesn't take into account the price, right? Consumers want a good price for stuff. So it might have, it might have a five-star rating on the fact that that phone you just bought can be reused and broken down and reused into other parts. But if the price is good, they'll take the price every time. And I think that's the hard bit. That's the, um, but I think, I think 
I think we've got people that what we actually need in society are people that are okay with using something that someone else has already used. And if you look at things like vintage, if you look at things like car sharing, we are increasingly seeing people comfortable with uh, buying stuff that someone else has had the benefit of. And that ultimately will fuel the, uh, the, the circular economy. You've got, you've got to be happy. And actually, as human beings, you know, at a fundamental level, we're, uh, we're, all, the, we're all the dust and atoms that were from many, many generations before us. But when it comes to having the latest shiny new car, this latest shiny new phone, uh, we want shiny new. Uh, and that's um, something to break the habit of. Alistair, your thoughts on this, because mm. it is difficult in specific sectors where mm. high profits, high shareholder returns are commonplace and expected, especially mm. by a shareholder audience. Mm. So what's required to, to break that dependency, if you like, to sort of move in a different direction? And I know we're back to the behavior change thing again, mm. and it does take time, but mm. what role perhaps does external agencies such as governments play in this uh, in this transition yeah yeah well i think i think it's everybody understands now and governments in particular understand the importance of things like climate change and environmental um, aspects and perspectives uh, recycling is becoming much more on the agenda so i don't think it's a i don't think it's an awareness thing um, we all know we all know without anybody telling us that you know the climate is being hammered at the moment um, by our behaviors so it's not it's not an education thing but speaking as a person who runs a business um, and you know having had responsibilities to shareholders and so on in the past the, the priority always is or seems to be to the shareholders you know to make the maximum returns um, to do whatever is possible to trim margin, to to well, to maximise the margin and to trim the costs and so on. And until there's a mechanism in place that allows business people um, and consumers to be financially incentivized to move towards the circular economy or move more towards the circular economy, we're always going to have this uphill struggle. I mean, one of the one of the things, and I go back to my health tech days again. We we tried many many things in the past to try and get people to engage with health technology. In other words, to lose weight or to give up smoking or whatever it might be. And no amount no amount of education, no amount of persuasion, um, no amount no amount of really good, exciting technology with the latest graphics and all the rest of it. You could get a small movement in behaviours, but until you put a financial incentive in people's way, people just didn't move. And, you know, to me, from a behavioural science perspective, this is about making, uh, appealing to the things that turn people on, both business people and consumers. And unfortunately, it's the pound sign that turns people on. And until we find a way of, making the circular economy more attractive to business people to pursue, or as Graham said there, the prices of products that have been recycled to be more cost-effective um, in, in favour of the consumer, we're probably still going to have this up. It's going to be an uphill struggle for years to come. Mm. So, Graham, resource scarcity and tighter environmental standards are here to stay. Let's, let's agree yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, educated consumers who are sustainability orientated are now more commonplace. Mm -hmm. And the idea of whole system design is becoming more prevalent, I think, across many, many sectors and industries. Mm -hmm. So mindful of these realities, where are the opportunities in general industry to immediately create new circular economy centric companies? Yeah, I think uh, the companies coming through now, I, 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 I hear the term net positive a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean? That, so that could be an environmental thing. It could be a societal net positive impact too. Or most companies are quite good at net positive 
impact. They they take some money in, they do something, and they provide a return. Most companies are net positive. Yeah. Um, but net positive on the environment. I'll take an example. Of a, there's a, a project that they were looking between Normandy and Sussex, which is to um, to to run uh, cargo freight across across the channel. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we don't want to use carbon to move things around uh, the world, 100 kilometers. We don't want to because the resource is scarce. Now, one resource that isn't scarce is wind. The wind is not a scarce resource. In fact, because of climate change, it's getting increasingly stronger. Mm. So the, the, the point is that some resources are becoming scarce because people have got greedy and they consume more than they had to, but actually the wind is getting stronger. Therefore the answer is how do we move cargo across the channel using a new resource that is more abundant wind. Um, but actually that's not enough. It's not enough to uh, uh, take something that would have used a diesel engine to move across the channel and replace it with, with, a, with a sail. So going from negative carbon impact to, to 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 neutral what we're looking at uh, with this project is can we generate hydrogen as a result of that wind power so that when we dock a boat uh, we unload zero carbon pallets and then we unload some hydrogen that has been generated in that journey into the grid in the place where we're we're moving the, the cargo into so suddenly we're operating at neutral carbon and we're actually adding something to the place we're delivering we're adding something in that other people can benefit from so net positive environmentally is super important and that's where there's a massive opportunity for people to innovate there's some very cool products ideas services out there that will uh, leave much more put much more positive into the environment than they take out mm. i think that's a, a fabulous example and mm. A, a, a showcase of how things can be done and thinking that can be incorporated into yeah. a, a business that is very carbon heavy to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, Alistair, coming back to you and, and getting a bit more specific around what you're doing with Goscombe Homes, how is the circular economy coming to life within uh, your business? Uh, well, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, and it's, um, you know, from, your dealings with Goscombe and your, you know, our relationship that we've had over the years that Goscombe was seeded from a desire to see things done better, not just in terms of the way we do business, but also in the way that we, we perform, um, the way we use, use materials. So there are all sorts of ways that we're looking at that. And we're looking at it both from the um, the, the, the production end as well as the operational end. So we've got a real focus on making sure that whatever we do within the production end of things, we're doing what we can to try and bring in things like the circular economy and low carbon, uh, you know, energy efficiency and so on. We could go on for a long, long time talking about all the different things we're intending to do within our manufacturing hub to do that. We're also looking then at the the life cycle of the product as well. So in terms of how you as a tenant or as a resident in one of our homes, how do you benefit from things that we're putting into that, that product itself, that home? Um, because we're not just about housing affordability, we're also about you know, the inequality that comes from fuel poverty as well. So we've got a real desire to drive down the cost of running homes. We've also got a desire to see our product at the end of its life cycle being deconstructible, if you like, or reusable. So even if you're doing a running repair on a property, can you take that tile from the roof and can you do something with it whilst replacing it with another one? So, you know, the, the, there's so many times throughout the life cycle of a house from production all the way through to deconstruction, decommissioning, where you, you have opportunities to bring the circular economy to life. And so we're, we're really looking in a lot of detail at each of those areas to see where we can do things. And it, it, it breaks down to three things, if I'm honest, John. One is, one is around materials, you know, being very, very prudent, and very, very careful about materials that we use. Um, the second is making sure that we have this cycle of disassembly as well. 
so that when we build something, we're designing it for deconstruction at the end. And we do that, you probably know from the designs that we have, um, you know, we're a panelized system and therefore it's possible to take even just take a panel and the components of that panel to be deconstructed and to put a new panel in. So you can change the shape and form of the house as you go along. Um, and then you've got the things like the renewable energy sources as well. So the power that we put into the factory, the vehicles that drive our product from the factory to the site, the, the way that those houses operate going forwards and how we then remove those sites, those, those houses from site. Those are the types of areas that we're focusing on. And as I say, it would take a long time to describe detail in all of those, but when you start looking at this, and this is the message really for any business, you don't just apply the circular economy to one point of your business. It's, it's something that if you really think about it, it goes from end to end, you know, cradle to grave really on your entire business. Um, and that, that's, a, that's been a really interesting journey for us. And we've had the advantage of coming from a clean slate rather than having to inherit something where we've had to, you know, go backwards and, and retrospectively change things. Um, so it's a unique opportunity that we've had to put the circular economy into place in, in Goscombe. Well, what I'm hearing is exactly what you've said there, Alistair, this end-to-end -end thinking and this whole system design being embedded into the DNA of Goscombe Homes, yes. which brings it to life at every single stage of the journey, which is a wonderful way of, mm. of doing it and, and mm. ensuring that people walk the talk and actually implement it uh, effectively mm. at each stage and each step. So mm. just to wrap this up, I'm going to come back to you, Graham. Um, what do you feel are the three most pressing actions that need to be taken to accelerate awareness and behavior change around the circular economy? Yeah, it's interesting. I guess, I guess if you're a company, I know one of your members, just how, how to think about it. I, the first thing is resource scarcity, right? So assume that you cannot buy anything else in externally to run your business. Imagine all your suppliers stop supplying you with stuff. That mm -hmm. is uh, just to model that. Okay, so how are we going to run this business if we cannot buy anything new, new in and we have to reuse what we've already got or what we've already put out there to our customers? Then, then you start to innovate. Okay, what could we, how could we do this? How could we do that? So model that scenario. I think the, se the second thing is, um, is, uh, every business will be unintentionally creating future waste it business you know whenever you create something you you unintentionally create waste somewhere in the future in the system every industry let's look at the satellite industry right there's loads of space junk flying around that the original mm -hmm. purpose was to enable people to communicate with each other anywhere in the world or anywhere but the, 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 the unintentional consequence of the satellite industry is a load of space junk. Someone, there's an opportunity. So look around as a business. Where are there pools of waste for other people that you could do something with differently and repurpose it that already exists without ever having to dig any natural materials out of the ground? And, and, I, and I think, and, and the other thing uh, the circular economy is also about is looking at ideas you've already had that maybe didn't have the right time and place in the past. So the circular economy is not only about how you treat materials that you've already got, physical things, but actually ideas. And a great example, if we want to revolutionize the marine industry, the sail has been in existence for thousands of years. It's free energy. But we know that at scale, sails don't work in the way they did. So how do we innovate ideas we've had in the past to actually bring them into the, the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very interesting. Alistair, I'll leave the last word to you. You're magically on television and all the business leaders across Ireland and the UK can hear you. What's your message about the circular economy to them? I think it's, it's one thing really, and I think is that to help the economy to understand the need for the circular economy from an investment point of view. Um, yeah, I, I guess that would be my single message is really where put, put some money on the table to encourage the circular economy to take off. 
at the moment investment seems to be directed at the linear economy um, there's the the investors at the moment are not incentivized to uh, in the right way to invest in startups that are focused on the circular economy therefore there's few entrepreneurs or many entrepreneurs who want to do something about it but can't do something about it because the funding is not there um, so I, I think really it's about the I think it's about incentivizing both the investment into the entrepreneurs behind it, but also investment into the companies that are ancillary to the circular economy as well. I'm just picking up on a point that Graham, you raised a little earlier about the new jobs that are coming or the jobs that are being created through this. There's a whole plethora of new companies, new, new streams that are being established or could be established on the back of the circular economy around recycling. And we've, we've started to see this with companies that are making money out of waste. And, and, and there's a whole, there is a whole area of investment to be done to incentivize people to think about the jobs that run alongside the circular economy rather than the jobs that run alongside the linear economy. So it's my message would be put some money on the table and let's get some real tax breaks and some real incentives to make this economy work. Alistair, thank you so much. Very insightful. Graham, thank you for your inputs and uh, considered thinking today very much appreciated i think we could probably talk for a couple of hours on this because it is a very relevant topical subject mm -hmm. however let's draw to a close today so ladies and gentlemen this has been a bit of business my name is john fitzgerald thank you so much for watching all the best for now mm -hmm.